Spielvogel calls the 1920s and 30s the retreat from democracy in Central Europe. That's quite accurate and very helpful. The rise of fascism in Italy and Germany occurred through legal democratic channels that resulted in the formation of totalitarian dictatorships in which there was no personal freedom, in which Europe experienced, Central Europe at least, most particularly Germany and Italy, experienced a complete retreat from democracy. Now, in Italy and Germany, the political ideology and governing idea that emerged is called fascism, F-A-S-C-I-S-M. Now, what is fascism? It can be a very difficult thing to understand, and fascism and communism look a lot alike. And they look a lot alike because they are systems of government and political ideologies in which there is no personal freedom. However, they are ideological opposites and inherent enemies. So let's look at communism first. We have studied Marxism and communism already. So just kind of a reminder. Um, I like the two cow idea here. I think that's very helpful. You can Google the two cow philosophies of government and it will give you all kinds of, of all kinds of metaphors of government systems around the world, basically broken down into the idea of two cows. And you can see here, communism, you have two cows. The state takes both and gives you some milk. And this is pretty telling, it's, it's absolutely correct. In communism, there is the abolition of private property. The state has taken both of your cows. The state distributes resources and does all the economic planning. So they give you some milk. How much milk do they give you? They get to decide. How much milk do you deserve? They get to decide. Um, in addition to all the cow stuff, there is no religion, there is no personal freedom. And very importantly, in communism, the state is to wither away. Communism, under the Marxist formula, is um, opposed to nationalism. Now, this is going to look a lot like fascism, but fascism and communism are very different. So let's look at our fascist cow. In fascism, you have two cows. The state takes both and sells you some milk. And so you see in both the prominence of the state. But in fascism, uh, your cows are still yours. The state has taken them, but they are still yours. They sell you milk because there is still a capitalist model, which involves the ownership of private property and the um, exercise of private business. Uh, there is no concept of equality between people in fascism as there is in communism. Communism is predicated upon the idea of equality between people. In fascism, this is not so. Fascism accepts and glorifies the idea that some people are better than others. Thus, the idea of, for example, the supremacy of the Aryan race, according to Adolf Hitler, etc. In fascist uh, societies, religion is okay as long as the church toes the line of the state and does not oppose the state. And most importantly, fascism is predicated upon the idea of extreme nationalism. Now, unlike communism, where the state is to wither away, in fascism, the state is everything. And this is why they are inherent enemies. This doesn't necessarily always make sense in real life because it just doesn't, but ide from an ideological standpoint, in communism, the state is to wither away, and in fascism, the state is everything. The state is more important than the individual, and that's the most important underlying factor. Everything is done for the state, and that is why um, fascism is inherently anti-capitalist, because capitalists promote self, capitalism promotes self-interest, and so fascism isn't about self-interest. It's about the interest of the state. This is why the state has your cows and they are selling you the milk, even though the state does allow the ownership of private business and um, private property. Now, in fascism, unlike communism, a very charismatic dictator uh, with incredible personality is very, very important. Fascism really cannot exist outside 
the existence of this person who can kind of uh, pull everyone and a society to himself and make all of this happen. Now, communism abhors this idea. Now, again, it, it doesn't always operate in that reality, but communism abhors the idea of the individual uh, and, and fascism to an extent does too, but fascism just doesn't work without an, a, a charismatic individual. Where they are alike, where communism and fascism are alike, is that they are states in which there is no personal freedom and they both rely heavily upon the existence of secret police and fear uh, to govern their people. I like this explanation of fascism on this poster, a political system where the state comes before the individual, which is headed by a dictator, bureaucracy, republic, probably a dictator, fascism really only works with that, that is distinguished by career leaders, typically for life, dictator, where individuals are subject to arbitrary search and seizure under the pretense that what is good for the whole outweighs the one. The very important in fascism, what is good for uh, the state is more important than you. Now, in communism, what is good for the whole is more important than you. So something they have in common. So they are inherent enemies, but they look a lot alike, and it can be very difficult, uh, very difficult to understand. Fascism was really born as a political ideology with Benito Mussolini in Italy. Uh, Mussolini was a veteran of World War I. He was very charismatic and politically savvy. He was a very strong nationalist. He felt personally insulted by the way Italy was treated at the um, proceedings at Versailles. He felt like they should have been more respected and given more say in what happened. Now, Mussolini isn't as, as famous in history as Hitler, and I think it's very safe to say that he was not as effective but he's really a good case study in how fascism usually works. In the 1920s in Italy, Mussolini came to power as the prime minister under the King Victor Emmanuel II through legal channels and legal means. He was elected as, uh, as it were. But even following his election and his coming to power through legal means, he staged this huge, quote, march on Rome in which he really followed in the footsteps of Garibaldi uh, going back to the unification of Italy. This huge public spectacle calling to himself uh, nationalists and patriots of all kinds. And he marches into Rome and he seizes power. He seizes the office, which was already his. This was a very dramatic public spectacle. It was unnecessary, but it really conveyed, um, from a psychological stance, a very it made a very powerful impact to people who might oppose him in Italy. Uh, made a very powerful impact as to his support and to his power. And so here are some people in, in Italy saluting Mussolini as prime minister, and you see the Nazi salute, which we more often associate with Hitler here. Mussolini was a pretty successful leader. Um, he called himself Il Duce, the leader, and so Il Duce was a military man. You always saw him in military uniform. This idea of uniform and conformity and nationalism is very, very important to fascism. Okay, so you will see this a lot in fascist Italy and fascist Germany. Um, almost uniform looking people, public spectacle, large numbers of people, large demonstrations, very important to the whole idea, conformity, etc. So anyone who might oppose needs to feel like they are the odd man Here's Il Duce giving a speech in Rome to a throng of people. Um, the radio and essentially public address systems uh, really made fascism work without the ability to reach mass audiences at any one given time. This whole idea really didn't work because this isn't the divine right of kings, the divine right theory of kings. This is a human person who has seized power they really have to be able to use propaganda and technology to reach a mass audience to, to spread their ideas and to kind of enforce this 
uh, these societal norms that they are attempting to, uh, to impose. Now, what was Mussolini about? Italian nationalism. Mussolini wanted to bring back the glory days of the Roman Empire. This is what he promised the Italian people who suffered mightily in the 1920s and 30s during the Great Depression. Italy totally skipped the Roaring Twenties. There was no Roaring Twenties for them. Um, he promoted a strong work ethic and industrialism, and he wanted to bring a stronger industrial revolution to Italy. Now, this is where Mussolini was pushing a boulder uphill because this just went countercultural to the way Italians had been for hundreds and hundreds of years, this idea of an industrious and hardworking people. But he tried, and he tried really, really hard. And in order to improve... Italy's economy, he invested in public works and he invested in industry. He also invested in traditional values, and these are very important in fascism as well. Traditional values are, um, especially traditional values when it came to marriage and to gender roles. Mussolini made it illegal for women to work in most jobs in industry, the idea being that women could be mothers or could be nuns. And, um, and this was supposed to help there to be greater employment opportunities for men, as well as to increase Italy's population. And Mussolini encouraged, used the government to encourage a society where men and women married and the women stayed home and had many children. They really encouraged very large families through, uh, through their official government policies. Uh, Mussolini also promoted the Catholic Church. He wasn't necessarily, from a, in a personal way, a great Catholic or anything, but he saw the Catholic Church for what it was, a very important institution in Italian life, and an institution that could help him promote his ideas, especially those of um, the traditional family, etc. And he had a deal with the Catholic Church in that Mussolini wouldn't criticize the church and wouldn't hold back the church or restrain the church in any way as long as the church didn't criticize him. And so he used Catholicism as, as much as he could to his advantage. Now Mussolini's push to make Italy an industrious and efficient country was, was perhaps his greatest failure. He just couldn't do that. He couldn't change the Italian culture and mindset into this really highly organized, really hardworking kind of people that just wasn't their culture. But Mussolini is most famous in history for making the trains run on time in Italy. And if you've ever been to Italy, you will understand, lovely country as it is, that this was quite an accomplishment. Now, Adolf Hitler in Germany achieved a great deal more effectiveness, I guess I would say, with fascism than Mussolini did in Italy. Hitler is Austrian by birth, yet he becomes the chancellor and the dictator of Germany. Let's go back to Bismarck and the unification of Germany. One of the questions before Germany was unified was the question of big Germany versus little Germany. Bismarck, being the chancellor of Prussia, had pushed Austria out of the proceedings. So he went with Prussian-dominated little Germany. Hitler, being born and raised Austrian, grew up in a strongly nationalist mindset of big Germany. He was an advocate of a strongly nationalist strain of political idea called pan-Germanism, meaning all Germans together. Fascism is strongly, strongly nationalistic. It's nationalistic more than it is anything else. And Hitler was hugely influenced in his youth by ideas of pan-Germanism, that Germany should be big Germany not little Germany. And so his whole life, he considered himself, uh, he considered himself a German. And he, uh, he was an artist by training. He was a really uh, 
stellar soldier during World War I. In fact, he called attention to himself for his success and his superiority during World War I. Ironically, he was not highly promoted because his superiors thought he was a little bit off mentally. It's a little bit crazy, but he distinguished himself as a soldier. So following World War I, Hitler, like many Germans, um, which he's always considered himself a German, even though he's born Austrian, Hitler um, became involved with the Nazi party, the Nationalist Socialist German Workers Party. The first word in this party is nationalist, socialist. He was anti-capitalist. He did not um, believe in, in the bourgeois capitalism of England, etc. He was strongly anti-Semitic, and this goes back to his Austrian roots as well. He's strongly anti-Semitic. He hated the Treaty of Versailles. He he saw Versailles and, and the work of the Jews as being responsible for the problems of the Germans. And so in the early 1920s, Hitler, as a veteran of World War I, he becomes involved with this party, and he quickly rose through its ranks. It brings him to prominence in the politics of Germany, I guess I would say. And so in 1923, in November of 1922, 1923, Hitler and some buddies were drinking in a beer hall in Munich. They were drinking um, and they had a lot of beer and they engaged in what is called the beer hall pooch that night. And this is Hitler and his Nazi buddies, Nationalist Socialist German Workers Party. And um, Hitler supposedly like grabbed his sword and he jumped on the table and he claimed how they were gonna overthrow the Weimar Republic. And it was a really failed effort. It was a weak, weak effort and overthrow of the government. You know, a bunch of junk guys uh, waving around their knives and swords and claiming they're going to do this. But anyway, they were arrested and Hitler was seen as their leader, if you will. And he was put in jail, but he was put in jail for nine months. And he had a very sympathetic judge, a judge who was sympathetic to his ideas, who hated the Weimar Republic, etc. And so Hitler had kind of, cushy situation um, while he was in prison and he had his own cell and he had a desk and he was able to read and write for most of the day and it was while he was in prison that he wrote his very famous work Mein Kampf, My Struggle. This translates to My Struggle and in Mein Kampf Hitler laid out his worldview, essentially, um, his very deep nationalism and his whole idea that Germany's problems were not the fault of the good German people, whom Hitler considered to be the superior race. Uh, he laid the blames for their problems, their very real problems at this particular time, you remember the hyperinflation in the Weimar Republic, that these problems were the fault of the terrible terms imposed by the Treaty of Versailles, by England and France, and by the Jews. Uh, really, really scapegoated the Jews as turncoats, as sellouts, as people who were not German. Um, in Mein Kampf, Hitler also articulated his idea of Lebensraum. His idea of Lebensraum was an idea of living space, living space for the superior race, for the Aryan race. And in order to gain Lebensraum, Hitler said, the German people, the Aryan people were going to have to uh, get rid of the Jews, expel them, exterminate them, conquer the territories to the east, the Slavic nations to the east, Poland, the Ukraine, etc., and enslave those people so that the Germans could have, the Aryan race could have a living space. And, uh, you know, here he's saying all of this in the early 1920s, yet, as we shall see, in the 19, late 1930s and 1940s, the world was taken by surprise by Adolf Hitler. Hitler, like Mussolini, 
came to power through legal means. He rose through the ranks of the Nazi party. He was an incredibly effective and charismatic speaker. He flew all over the country, giving speeches, holding campaign rallies, winning support for the Nazi party. Adolf Hitler really made the Nazi party a mainstream party. And um, across the 1920s and into the 1930s, the Nazi party gained seats in the German Reichstag. And eventually, by 1933, Adolf Hitler, as the leader of the Nazi party, became the chancellor of Germany. Here he is seated with Paul von Hindenburg, the president of the Weimar Republic. And so he comes to power through legal means within the Weimar Republic. When Hindenburg died a year later, Hitler was made the president of the Republic. In 1935, he had the Reichstag pass a piece of legislation called the Enabling Act. The Enabling Act enabled Hitler to exercise the complete powers of the state. They essentially gave Hitler the powers of dictatorship. And so by 1935, Hitler had become the unquestionable leader of Germany, the individual leader of Germany, the absolute leader and dictator of Germany. In Hitler's Germany, just like in Mussolini's Italy, spectacle and conformity were of the utmost importance because um, this is all predicated on nationalism and spectacle and, and you kind of bring everybody in this way. And the psychology was incredibly, incredibly powerful. There was a lot of conformity. People dressed in uniform. Everything looked military. The swastika, the Nazi flag, designed by Hitler, by the way, was everywhere. And so here's Hitler saluting a group of his troops. Here he is delivering an address. Adolf Hitler was a remarkable speaker. He was incredibly engaging, very charismatic. The man could speak for hours and he could hold captive attention of audiences. He was really quite remarkable and he used this gift, this talent of his to great effect in Nazi Germany. You can see here again, look at the swastika, look at the flags that are everywhere. The idea of conformity was profound. Conformity and nationalism was was profound. Here's Hitler with Mussolini in 1933. This is uh, when he had just become chancellor. He was a great fan of Mussolini. He considered himself a protege, a student of Mussolini's, um, even though really he he did all this better and more effectively than Mussolini did. But you know, Hitler had Germany. The Germans are industrious and efficient and kind of organized people. Their culture is entirely different. And in a lot of ways, a lot more equipped, I guess I would say, for, um, for fascism. Here are Nazis marching at a rally. Hitler used a spectacle to great effect. He used propaganda to great effect. One of Hitler's greatest moments in the early 1930s was the Nuremberg rally, at which there were more than 160,000 people lined up quietly in rows, 160,000, so 60,000 more people than are at a football game at UT on a Saturday in the fall. And instead of cheering wildly and randomly, they're all quiet. They're all waiting for the Fuhrer to come and speak to them to engage with them. And at this particular rally, he came to lay a wreath at the tomb of the unknown soldier. Very moving and uh, prophetic idea, but here's 160,000 people waiting in total silence for Hitler to speak to them. He had a very, very powerful effect um, on people. Hitler ideas. What did he promote as dictator? A lot of the same things that Mussolini did. Uh, the Nazi flag was everywhere. The ideas of conformity were everywhere. He promoted the state, the fatherland. The state came before all. Everything was done 
for the state. He really promoted traditional values, the traditional family. He encouraged marriage and childbearing, um, women to have children. He he didn't exclude women from working the way that Mussolini did, but he did limit them to more traditional women's professions, teaching, nursing, social work, etc. They were excluded from other professions, and he encouraged uh, the bearing of children. He really strongly encouraged women to be wives and mothers, and perhaps no more effectively than in his uh, very public promotion of the Mother's Cross. Uh, think of Mother's Day. Mother's Day in Nazi Germany was a big national holiday with public celebrations at which the mothers of many children were awarded publicly across a woman who had borne four children to the fatherland and you didn't bear them for your family. These children were born for the fatherland. They were born for Germany. A woman who bore four children for the fatherland was awarded a bronze cross, a woman who had bore six or more, a silver, a woman who had bore eight or more, a gold cross. And so think of the very powerful effect that this would have. You know, women were encouraged to have large families and lots of children for the fatherland and were given public recognition for that. And there was lots of state-sponsored welfare programs for large families, etc. Aryan families, of course, German families, of course, is what we are, what we are talking about. In 1936, uh, a German woman made a, a piece of propaganda, one of the best pieces of propaganda in the history of politics called the triumph of the will to extol the success of the Nazis. This is what this piece of propaganda did. And it showed how great, how great the Germans were. This is really Hitler at the apex of, of his powers, his fascism at his finest. Also a great example of how important public spectacle and propaganda is to fascism. You just can't have a type of government like this in an era where you don't have the technological means, whether through the radio, et cetera, to reach a mass audience. Now Hitler specifically is known for his anti-Semitism, but anti-Semitism was so widespread in Europe and particularly during this time. In 1933, when Hitler became Chancellor of Germany, one of the first laws he had the Reichstag passed were called the Nuremberg Laws, 1933. And the Nuremberg Laws essentially took away citizenship, German citizenship from the Jews, from any person of Jewish ancestry. Now this is important because what does this mean? It means a Jew is not German. There were not huge protests or anything against this. The Jews had a hundreds year long history of being persecuted. You know, you've got to remember to them, this is just like one more thing that they're forced to deal with. The Nuremberg laws were hugely anti-Semitic. They deprived Jews of German citizenship. They denied them things like the right to buy property, uh, the right to marry non-Jews, the right to own businesses. Um, to do any number of things. But this is the start. This is the start down the road to the Holocaust. Okay, and it's very important to understand that Hitler's policies against the Jews were piecemeal. He does not come into his political power with this idea of extermination. But he started here with depriving Jew, uh, German Jews of their citizenship requiring them to live in ghettos, establishing essentially um, segregation. There were places that Jews were forbidden. There were things they were forbidden to do. And you can see here, Jews are forbidden. This is what this sign says. So the Jews can't come in. These were very, very similar to the Jim Crow laws in the United States that were like whites only. Um, you know, black people can't come into this public space or they can't use this bathroom or water fountain. It was the very, very same idea. The Nuremberg Laws prohibited marriage between Germans and Jews. And this is what these people on the top, they're saying is forbidden, verboten. The black man, uh, the man in black is a Jew, the white woman Right there, she's representing an Aryan, a uh, purebred of UL German woman. You are not allowed to get married. 
And we see here the Jewish man, and again, a woman of mixed ancestry, Jewish and German, and even that was forbidden. And not only was marriage forbidden, any kind of socialization or intercourse, sexual or otherwise, was forbidden and was punishable by public humiliation. The 1936 Olympics in Berlin were a very important moment for Adolf Hitler. He was eager to show to the world how far Germany had come. And indeed, Germany had come quite far. Uh, they had come back from the edge of the abyss. Uh, Germany in 1936 was quite prosperous and it was very stable and they were moving forward. They were building the Audubon. They were investing in infrastructure and in their army and the people were happy supposedly and everything was great. And so Hitler looked forward to hosting the 1936 Olympics in Berlin to show off Germany and to show off the superiority of the German race, which uh, Hitler expected his athletes to perform very, very well at the Olympics, which they did. And here's a photograph from the 1936 Olympics. Um, I encourage you to read about these Olympics. There are all kinds of great stories surrounding them. How in the city of Berlin, when the world came to Berlin, they took down all the signs that said Jews forbidden, etc. Uh, the world was impressed by the cleanliness and efficiency of the city and the, and the really great prowess of the German athletes and, and the hospitality of Adolf Hitler. The great surprise of the Olympics to Hitler and to others, and this is a great story, was none other than the American Jesse Owens who in 1936 not only won gold medals in the 100 meter sprint and the 200 meter sprint, but set world records in those events as well. Hitler was really frustrated by Jesse Owens because Jesse Owens was black and Hitler's uh, ideas about racial purity, of course, did not only extend to uh, the Jews and, and anti-Semitism. He, of course, was strongly uh, racist in, in terms of color and nationality, etc. And so it bugged him so much, it made him so mad that this black man from the United States came to his Olympics and had the audacity to win, and not only to win, but to set world records. And so here's Jesse Owens as the gold medal winner saluting the flag. Um, you have a Korean in the silver position and a German in third place. You can see him giving the salute. Hitler was furious about Jesse Owens, and this really became a cause for him to criticize the United States, and his criticism of the United States was just. He said, how dare this country who discriminates against this man at home, and he rightfully pointed out that Jesse Owens, who was from Alabama, could not even attend college in his own state. He had to go to Ohio. Jesse Owens went to Ohio State University, not to the University of Alabama, for school because they refused to admit him because he was black. And, and he really said, you know, how dare this country that discriminates against this man and won't let this man do all kinds of things in, in their country sends him over here to run for them in the Olympics. Fair criticism, very fair criticism. But he also accused the United States of cheating in the Olympics. He said that everybody knew that blacks were part animal and whoever would compete a part animal against a human, a fully human person was cheating. And so he said that as well. But Jesse Owens did great and had a heroic Olympics at, at these events and uh, was quite a, quite a thorn in, in Hitler's, in Hitler's side. Hitler and Mussolini and all fascists really invested heavily in their youth. This is an idea, this is a way of life, this uh, fascism is. And so you really had to get the kids to buy in. You had to train them from, from the time of their childhood. And so all pure German, 
children, the Aryans, were required, boys at least, to enroll in an organization called the Hitler Youth. Mussolini had a similar organization in Italy. And as part of the Hitler Youth, uh, this is like a combination or a cross-section between the Boy Scouts and military training. They learned to be good Germans, they learned basic military skills and outdoor skills, but this is really kind of like organized propaganda. You become part of part of this. But for fascism, this kind of buy-in, this kind of total social reach was incredibly important. And so Mussolini and Hitler both did this very well. Like you bring in, you bring in the children. And they both genuinely loved children very much. Uh, you can see here Hitler's belief in, in children. Uh, the youth loved their Fuhrer, who's a sweet little blonde girl. There was a sister organization to the Hitler Youth for Girls. Um, you can see her. Look at our, our really strong, brave boy with the Fuhrer's face behind him, you know, backing him up. They were all in with the Fuhrer, uh, you know. Do children love their Fuhrer? Yes, they do, and he loved them. Hitler did not have any children of his own, but by all accounts, he loved children very much, and he invested heavily in them. He invested in Germany in education, in food programs for children, making sure they had enough milk, uh, welfare programs for families, etc. Was this born out of the goodness of his heart? You know, perhaps to an extent, but it's all part of the program as well. As you got to, you got to win them over. 1938, Adolf Hitler was Time Magazine's Man of the Year. The world came to the 1936 Olympics in Berlin, and the world was impressed. Now, it's 2017. We can look back and know what kind of a crazy madman this dude turned out to be. But he was an effective leader and he pulled Germany back from the precipice, from the abyss. He made them stable. He made them economically prosperous. And in 1938, Time Magazine's Man of the Year, the world was impressed with Adolf Hitler.